episode 90 of Outlander Cast is brought to you by The Muse Studios on Etsy. Head to www.themusestudios.etsy.com and use the coupon code OUTLANDERCAST30 for 30% off your total order from the best Outlander shirts there are in the interwebs. Uh, Outlander Cast 30330. Yes. Yes, okay. Thank Good. you. Just, just making sure the we got numbers. that The numbers, 30. <laughs> Jenny, no! James Alexander Malcolm Mackenzie Fraser, otherwise known as Red Jamie. You are hereby under arrest for high treason against His Majesty King George. And my own sister! Put him in the irons! How could you? This is your own fault. You brought this on yourself. Well done, madam. You've done a service to the crown. This is blood money! You gave me no choice, brother! And I'll never forgive you! Never! All the way from Cranston, Rhode Island, welcome to Outlander Cast. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> Super excited. We're here, of course, to chat about an amazing show. But first and foremost, my name is Mary Larson, and I'm your host. My name is Blake, and I never think it's a good idea to taunt British soldiers. Oh, my gosh. No, no not, not never. a good idea. If you learn anything from this episode, don't taunt soldiers. Yeah, right. No, no, no. Just, <laughs> just don't do it. Yeah, not, not a, a good idea. Not a smart choice, because otherwise you're going to get your hand cut off. And that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I. That's exactly what I said last night when yeah, Mary asked me, hey, what'd you think? Oh, got his hand cut off. That sucks. He, that's literally how he said it, too. We, he finished the episode. I'd already watched it, and he finished it. And I was like, so what'd you think? And he goes, I really liked it, but he got his hand cut off. That sucks. And I was like, that is your initial reaction. I'm so glad we didn't uh, go on Facebook Live for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a but it guy. does suck. So I'm I'm happy you said that. So you know we're gonna talk about this episode in great detail. It was uh, a very interesting episode. Covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. Covered six years for Jamie, to be exact. Um, let's start things off though with the kilt rating. Okay. What you would rate this episode on a one to five kilt ratio? I've been going back and forth on this one. Now I have written four point five, but I think I'm gonna go four point six. I, I'm going 4.6 because, you know, I just really enjoyed it. Okay. I, I enjoyed it full of character work. It was full of um, seeing Jamie in a bad place, seeing Claire in a bad place. In all of their actions, their environment were based on what they would normally do as a character. Nothing just came in all of a sudden. It was like, hey, I'm here. We're moving the plot forward. Like, it was just, it was them. Even the stuff when Jamie surrenders himself, that was character driven. That was, I have a family, they're in danger, I need I need to make a change. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And this is it. And the other thing I like about it too is that we actually have a real basis for us to begin with for season three. Like the, the, the premiere started us off. It was great. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. But we now finally have a floor. And we, we, we know where we're starting. Jamie is lost. He's he's got a problem. Claire is baby. They're trying to make it work. Claire is baby. So, <laughs> man, you are on a roll. Keep yeah. keep drinking. <laughs> just gonna, just, we'll just do that. How's that sound? What sound? Uh, I, I didn't even hear. Don't worry about it. You don't. I'll take your word for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'll take your word for so, it. So she's got the baby. Everything is happening, and you know, like it is what it is. So I like that. I like where we're starting. How about you, my darling? What do you got for your kilt? Four rating? and a half kilts, baby. So yes, it's a half notch down from last week. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, Is it just the excitement? There's not enough. There's not as much as much excitement for you now. 
th- I mean, this week was amazing and it probably should still be a five. I just feel like I need to hold out my fives. Mm-hmm. I feel like I went like five heavy by having it in the first. If I could, I would just give every episode a five. Let's be real. <laughs> Let's be honest. But I need to hold on for, um, you know, a, a couple more things. So, yes, this episode was amazing. Dynamite. Let's let's just go forward. Okay, I'm I'm down. What do you got for your GBG, my dad? Okay, my GBG, otherwise known as the good, bad, and great mm-hmm. thing of the episode. My good sex. <laughs> so much sex, and I can't believe I'm saying this on Facebook Live. Like it'd be one thing if it was just a podcast, but my mom might watch this. <laughs> you get some sex, and you get some sex. Everybody, everybody gets some, gets some sex. <laughs> so okay, um, something that was totally missing from Outlander for so long was sex. Um, well, in ma- season ma- two, yeah, mainly season in two. season two, okay. yeah. Um, so can I we, can we make another commandment, by the way? Please. We, we had a we had a first commandment last episode, the listener feedback episode. If mm-hmm. you go back and listen to it, the first commandment was every episode has to be balanced. You have to have good character, and you have to have a uh, good plot, and it has to be visually dynamic. That mm-hmm. is balance. The next commandment should be we should never speak about season two again. <laughs> that's my my opinion. We can vote on it in the clan, whoever whoever is watching live. But that's just my a lot opinion. of season two is good. A lot of season two. Mm. Peace to my homies. <laughs> I'm mm. sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt. Okay, I just so have to do that. Once again, I'll talk about this further, but I'm just so glad. So it gets a good old good. Some sex. Um, my bad. Where is Fergus's therapist? Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's just recap. Okay. Fergus was raped by Black Jack Randall. Rolled with the punches. Okay. No one got him a therapist. He just came under Jamie and Claire's wing. And just, there you go, Fergus. Nobody brings it up again. Let's just ignore all this pain that Fergus has gone through. Fergus now gets his hand chopped off by yet another British soldier. (laughs) Fergus is going to love British soldiers for the rest of his life, right? And, um, okay, Wilderness Jamie, all right, Wild, a.k.a. (laughs) Wild Jamie, yes, does what he needs to, saves the day. Ian then has this talk with Jamie where he's like, it's okay, you know, things like that happen to me too. Go talk to Fergus, Ian. Ian, please go sit next to Fergus, and while you're at it, get the local therapist to talk to this boy, but I will give Fergus credit because he did, of course, say at least he's a man of leisure now. I just feel bad. Is this this something that was wrong with the show? No, I just feel bad for this poor child who has literally been raped and had his hand chopped off and he's just the chillest out of anybody like if anybody had think of how much suffering jamie had think of how much suffering all these people have had and fergus is like whatevs man jamie fraser's now gonna take care of me i'm a man of leisure so that's the one thing that like i just watched and i was like oh fergus i'm gonna catch up with you one day um am i great Mm -hmm. was sam hewitt sam hewitt and his acting chops these past two episodes mm-hmm. i'm like sam what whoa whoa buddy i am so impressed he yep. has taken it to the next level i believe he is six years older slash he kind of reminds me of a president you know a president ages like 20 years in oh, the four years just look at president in office, obama plus their hearts that all these presidents guy. if you look at like how much being a president ages them it's insane and i feel like sam hewan was able to not only just take that six years but take the torment that that jamie has gone through and really just age him in his his mannerisms and his demeanor right he didn't look right it looked way different and i just loved his acting and even then how he flipped when he jenny i'm home you know like (laughs) how it's back to good old jolly jamie that we knew at the mere 23 years of age like Mm -hmm. he he just can switch it and um Way to go on that bum. Way to go. <laughs> Way to go on those exercises. How about you? What was your GBG? <laughs> I'm just proud of him. It takes work. It takes work. Oh, I man. don't have that bum. No, neither do I. Colum, Colum has a bum like that. We know we learned that from season one. Uh, my GBG, uh, the good. Laura Donnelly. Laura Donnelly absolutely killed it this episode. I mean, just unbelievable. Uh Everyone is talking about the the, the Jamie and, and uh, Jenny scene when she has to give him up. And I get it. We, we even played it at the beginning of this episode. It, it was a remarkable scene. 
But one of the scenes that really struck me was her scene as she's in bed talking to the British officers. And it's a, it is a, a tense, unbelievable scene. Not because you thought that Jenny was going to die or Jamie was going to die, but just what exactly is going to happen? You, you don't know how they're going to get out of it. And that is when you know you have a perfect tension in one scene. You don't necessarily know the outcome, but you see where things are happening. And you're like, what am I going to do? Because, you know, what? it's like those things when, um, like Superman, Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. You know the world is never going to blow up. Yes. Otherwise, they cannot continue this film. The world will never end. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, when you have those big major villains, it just falls short because it's truly. But when you have something small like this, mm -hmm. kind of like The Dark Knight, uh, I always reference The Dark Knight. The end of the movie isn't a big battle between two people. It's two boats. And one boat has a detonator, and one boat has another detonator, and they both got bombs. And you don't know what's going to happen because the stakes are that big. Mm -hmm. But they're important. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in this scene. But Jenny yelling at Jamie. And the thing is, when she says, I'm never going to forgive you, she's probably not lying. She's meaning it. Yeah. She's meaning it in a different way than British soldiers know. Right. But she's meaning it. I am never going to forgive you. She is. Laura Donnelly just killed it. Yes. She was amazing. Yes. Uh, my bad. Kind of like you, my darling. The, the Fergus scene with taunting the Redcoats. What are we doing? It just. It, it was filmed wonky, it, it sounded wonky, and he was like turning around and he was like laughing. <laughs> you, I hate you. You know, it just, it just, it felt like it was, they didn't know how to write it. It is different than the book. Right. So, and Ron Moore goes in to say that in a little like after show thing as well, that they elaborated, they kind of added the taunting. I don't and... mind, I don't mind elaborating, but it just felt, it, it felt like, it's film school. I, I I just I didn't like how they shot it. I didn't like the what the way they were writing it. I just I didn't like it. But my my great. And listen, uh, there are th certain things that get me off as a, a TV watcher, and there are certain things that just you know just are freaking awesome just, that just turn me on as a as a television or movie watcher, and that is when you have excellent visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that is perfectly encompassed by Frank and Claire at the end of the episode. Oh. The way that it was shot, him saying good night, turning off the light, turning off the light, everything like um, she says it, but she didn't. She, she says it. They smile. They look at each other. Yeah. You know that things are a little awkward because they just had the sex scene before, and she was like, "Look at me," and he was like, "Look at me," and she didn't want to, and you knew things were off. But so, here they are being like cordial, but saying good night. Yeah, like I'm saying, like you knew things were off, so it was like it was clear that it was like forced. Correct. But then you had the double whammy, and this was like a full pants off moment for me. Okay. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. This was a Keep pants, your pants off pants moment. On. We're on Facebook Live. This was a pants off moment. Okay. All of a sudden, is it like a Boston phrase? Uh, yeah, it's just when you get, you know, you get so excited, your pants come off. Yeah, I had a little, I had a little Outlander in my pants for this one. They pan out. I mean, the camera switches, the angle switches, and it shows the two separate beds. You know, you can have as much dialogue, as much exposition as you want. And this is something that I feel like season two really lacked in. Season one had a little bit of it, but season, season two had none of it. So far, season three has been full of it. And that is why it's a pants off moment for me. Because... It was it, that mm -hmm. one little bit said more than any other word possibly could. It was they were divided by space. They were divided by a dresser. They had separate beds. It is a chasm that will not be uh, walked or brought together ever again. They, they, there might as well have been the Grand Fracken Canyon between these two. So say we all. That's how that works. And I, and I, and, oh, that is my great. I thought that was phenomenal. All right. Let's get our GBDs from some of our listeners. Uh, Vicki Johnston uh, says, um, oh, what, hold on, what am I doing? I can do it for you. Oh, no, no, only... this was the kilt ratings. I'm sorry. This is the kilt ratings for, oh. from the listeners. Uh, after only one week, I can no longer hold back even one-tenth. So I'm giving episode 302 a full five kilt rating. Woo! 
I'm relieved that the Jamie Mary scene was handled with such sensitivity and discretion. It was just enough. Overall, a masterful job by Ann Kenny of distilling a ton of important story down to only an hour. Incredible. Laura Hager gives it five kilts again. Jamie's posture in this episode, the way he walks with absolutely zero swagger, tentative, looking like a fragile piece of china that might break at any moment. The eyes that showed no emotion and yet every emotion at the same time. His nonverbals were everything. You could see he was a shell of the man that stormed on the Culloden Moor. Visual storytelling. That is when you know you got the goods, baby. Mary Ayers says, I'm giving it four kilts. A few thoughts. First, who in the heck gave the British Jamie, uh, the British Jamie's exact description from the broadsheet on the title card? They got it off Instagram, okay? And, <laughs> and why can't the British it's seem selfie. to find him, even though Jamie wanders around mostly by daylight? Yep. Does he have a mysterious cloaking device in his beard or something? Maybe. You know what I'm thinking. <gasps> Does he have a deathly hallow? You're a wizard, Harry. Thank you. Also, for a guy who is supposed to be living all alone in a cave for years, in this episode, his cave is like Grand Central Station. Everybody's coming to party at Jamie's. All kinds of visiting going on there. And he spends most of he spends most of the episode at Jenny and Ian's. So the sense of loneliness is Mm -hmm. somewhat diminished. Mind you, I get that they probably needed to shoot during the day for most of the scenes for practical production reasons, so I can let that one go. And Sam does such a great job of portraying the shell of a man. Yep. My heart melted in empathy when he started crying in Mary McNabb's arms, and the double beds revealed for, Cla- for Claire and Frank, heartbreaking. I admit, I really enjoyed Claire and Jamie's, uh, Claire's Jamie fantasy. Ah, the daydream again for us sometime, Claire. And I cheered for when Joe Abernathy walked through the anatomy room door. I was a little skeptical, however, that every white male in the anatomy classroom would jeer and leer at both Joe and Claire. There had to be at least one progressive white man in the room. At least that was my hope. Good episode overall. I just have to say this real quick. Tell me. I'm going, I've learned my lesson. I was smoked on my comment. Uh, about the overdone misogyny uh, uh, for the last two episodes, and I said so. You got I, a little education. I did about what I it did. was like. T- Teddy, Teddy gave me the business, uh, so thank you, Teddy. But I will say this: Is this a? <laughs> you're laughing at me because no, you're I'm just laughing because people it. had to mans. <laughs> they had to they had to woman explain me. Yes. <laughs> um. Is this kind of like a um, an indictment on the world today, like the um, the American politics scene? That's how kind of like a bunch of old white dudes making decisions. It just that's just the way that You're it feels have to me. To ask Ron Moore. I know, I, and Ron Moore is not afraid to uh, throw it in people's faces. We saw that all throughout Battlestar Galactica. Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. So say we all. But I just feel like this feels a little bit of a, uh, a little something, something, a little something, something from okay. Ron Moore. Just, all right. just throwing that out there. Uh, my love, are you ready to get into this episode yes. recap and analysis? Yes. All right, let's do it. Well, this episode title was entitled Surrender with double meaning. We'll get into that in a little bit. Written by one Anne Kenny. Oh, my girl. She has written many episodes, uh, including The Wedding, The Hail Mary, The Fox's Lair, Lally Brock, The Way Out, Useful Occupations and Deceptions. And it actually looks like this is the only episode she writes for this season, at least according to IMDb. Uh, So if I'm wrong, kill IMDb, not me. (laughs) Um, This was directed by... Jennifer Getzinger. Now, who's this lady? This lady, she's a New England gal from from Connecticut. <gasps> Hello. So, Jennifer, if you listen, li- listening, I, I appreciate you. You're mm-hmm. my girl in Connecticut, even though Connecticut's kind of not really New England, but it kind of is. It's the bridge. It's like a halfway. It's like it wants to be New York, but it can't. It's okay. You know what I mean? You're still part of New England. Um, Gilmore Girls. <laughs> so, I will say though that she is a veteran TV director. Uh, she's directed Mad Men, Manhattan, Agent Carter, How to Get Away with Murder, Orange is the New Black, Revenge, Masters of Sex, Desperate Housewives, The Killing. 
In fact, she's been nominated by the Directors Guild of America for Outstanding Directing twice, both for Mad Men. She served as a script supervisor on, on Mad Men as well, and also The Sopranos. So this woman has been around a lot of great television. Yes. And from the directing job that she did, I would say it's – it shows. I, I think she does a, an amazing job. And the director of photography is my boy. I called him back. I said, Steve, I know you're doing a good job on this one. So I said, it, it's Steve McNutt. I, I knew he was going to do a great job. And he did, obviously. He's Steve McNutt. How could he not? So, my darling, now it's up to you. You're the host. Okay. How are we attacking this one today? Glad it, so, of course, the title is Surrender. Yes. But I'm going to flip things. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Wait, what are you going to do? <gasps> oh, roo, 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 roo. Okay, good. We're going to talk about family. All right. We're going to talk about family and um, the feelings that got associated with surrendering your idea of family. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Because family is something that is super important to Jamie, super important to Claire, super important to Fergus, and super important to Frank. It's super important to everybody in this bloody show, mm -hmm. except... Corporal McGregor, which whatevs. We're going to have a bone to pick with that oh, fella. That guy gave up. Uh, his, his, well, is it, no, not Corporal McGregor. The, the the two little jabronis that were under him. They were Scotsmen who gave up their country. It, uh, you know, and uh, that, that was I thought that. that was his name. Oh, really? I thought that was his name. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're 100% right. I was like all I, set with him. God, that's not my last name. I apologize. Okay, so Claire. I needed to talk about this because I feel like a lot of people have been questioning why Claire went and stayed with Frank. You know, and he even asked, he said that last episode, he said, you know, I, I didn't force you to come with me. I didn't force you to stay here. And we even got to see a little bit of previews of, of next week's episode and just to see time going on. And um, Claire has no other family. And I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So Claire came back from the stones. Mind you, time traveled. Who does that? Nobody. Time you know what? Twice. Time traveled twice. <laughs> Can't even talk about that with anybody or else they're going to put her in an insane asylum. She tells Frank and Frank's totally still how, somehow cool with it. She doesn't have any family. She's an orphan. She grew up with her Uncle Lamb. She doesn't have like cousins that she can go live with. So at this day and age, a pregnant woman, like newly pregnant, doesn't have a job, doesn't have a resume because she's been gone for the past few years, is pregnant. Where is she supposed to go? Valid Where point. is she supposed to go? She has no family. Mm. Valid point. Okay. So okay. I got you. And Frank's accepting of it. And Frank's saying, sure, coming in. And she's like, yo, I traveled through time, and I kind of love this man. I love him actually a lot, and I'm totally messed up. And he's like, no problem. Come on in. He acts the way that you would hope family would act. He, he would just believe you mm -hmm. and say, I get it. Yes. Don't worry about it. Yes. So, But some people are saying that he put conditions on this relationship that they have. And they're right. He did put conditions on it. Here's the debate. Are the conditions unreasonable? Is it is it unreasonable as a man to say, you are pregnant, we are together, I expect to raise this baby together as, as one? Is that fair? That, now, that's the real question. Frank, Frank doesn't put Claire in a mental institution. Frank doesn't make her go see a therapist. Frank... Right either believes her because we saw him starting to write to the reverend or he's like this woman who i love is kind of crazy right now mm -hmm. she's pregnant with someone else's baby but i love her she is my family so frank i'm assuming has family somewhere but he still goes to america with her to start a brand new family he gives up whatever of whatever relationships he had with other people whatever comrades right. he had he literally moves to a completely different country mm -hmm. to start anew with claire to start this family but i just feel like people you know a that day and age a pregnant woman couldn't just get a divorce and like start a new job and with what experience would claire have um with what money any of these kind of things but i feel like people were kind of getting after claire like why wouldn't she leave i don't think she could he is her family. He accepted her. Yes, he put conditions. But he accepted her coming yes. back and said, you are still my family. And family sticks by one another. Right. And, and even then, the conditions, I, I'm not sure they're all unreasonable. Even, even when they're in America, he says, stay, go. I, I, it doesn't matter to me. Just do what you want to do. I, I, 
I want to be a part of this. I, but you, you have to emotionally let me in. And this is something that I think a lot of people have been arguing about. And, and I get it. I get why mm -hmm. people are defending Claire. And it's, and for me, I'm a man. So it's, it's easier for me to look at Frank and say, Hey, I mean, the guy's being reasonable here. I, Stay, go, doesn't matter, but just let me be a part of your life. I wish he could let her talk about it more. You know, she couldn't bring it up. And, right. you know, we see at the age that Brie is, Brie rolls over. So she's sometime between four and six months. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I mean. Let, let's say this, too. Um, I don't want Claire and Frank to be, like, all lovey-dovey immediately. I don't want them to be like back in the throes of passion instantly. You, you cannot expect that from Claire. You, you just can't because yes, uh, someone had brought it to my attention uh, in, the, in the clan gathering, by the way, if you haven't got a chance, go to the clan gathering and, uh, and uh, on Facebook and join our group, which is amazing. The best Outlander Facebook group uh, on the interwebs. Uh, I think it was Martha Weaver who had mentioned this to me. She said, what if Mary had passed away mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you were with another person? Are you just as easily going to be with that person, even though you know Mary was once there? Are you going to feel that passionately? Are you going to open yourself up to that person? And it it brought that back for me. And I was like, no, I, I couldn't connect with that person as much mm -hmm. as I did with my beautiful wife sitting across the way from me right now. <laughs> but the difference would be I wasn't married prior to you. I wasn't in a relationship of this nature prior to you. And if that's the case, and if you're married to somebody else for that amount of time, you do have a mutual respect, at least. I'm not saying you have to be lovey-dovey. You have to be, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing that's ever. You don't have to be. But you have a mutual respect. And all I want from Claire is to just build on that mutual respect, to, to just open up a little bit over time. I think she's and trying. In, and in that first episode, I didn't see a whole ton of effort yeah. except for when Frank puts his hand on her shoulder and she allows that. Yes. I think that's a good first step. And of course, it's she it's also like, moved to America with him. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that a that's a big step. that's a big step too. That's a very big step. I'm happy to report that I do see Claire doing a lot more in this episode. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> That's what she said. Doing a lot more in this episode for Frank. Uh, not for Frank, but with Frank. and For the family and, that they are creating. Correct. And perhaps trying to create a little bit more. Now, is it genuine? Is it something that she really believes in with Frank? I don't know. And probably that's what that dinner scene was about, right? Because you saw, you saw Millie and uh, what's his name? Jerry? I don't know, the other jabroni? Bob. Bob. I'm going to call him Bob because he's from Jerry. Boston. Uh, <laughs> Bob from Boston over here. They had, as much as like she shit talked him in the first episode, sorry, we're on Facebook, sorry. As much as Millie gave a Jerry or Bob or Tom, whatever the heck his name is, crap, they had genuine affection for each other at the dinner table. And Frank and Claire are noticing that, and it doesn't seem to be as easy for them. It doesn't seem to be as genuine for them. It feels forced a little bit. And that's okay. I mean, they're still working. They're combining each other. They're, they're... It's still so new. That's what I'm saying. Like, and, and, They and, haven't even been together as long as they were apart. Yes. They haven't. She came pregnant, mm -hmm. like pretty, pretty pregnant through the stones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brie is only th four to six months right now. Mm -hmm. We can't expect her to be done with this so i i don't even know how i got on this tangent because of family and <laughs> as i said that's what struck me in this episode not just surrender but surrendering to the idea of a family or surrendering for your family mm -hmm. um yeah surrendering for your family i think would apply to both of these you know claire is surrendering so many parts of herself she is surrendering her truth her truth that she is in love with a different man She's right. surrendering to the society that doesn't see her as an equal to her male peers who, let's be honest, she could kick any and all of their butts. And she is going to. She is going to. <laughs> Tell mark, me, my theory is that, that my theory is still going to hold up. I which, don't care what anybody says. Which one? That 
that woman is going to deliver babies somehow, some way, and she's going to she take that dog, uh, d- doctor, and she's going to stick it to him. She's, she's she delivered uh, one of Jenny's many children, <laughs> many children. I love how Jenny's always a uh, always pregnant, always pregnant. She got she got eighteen kids, so, just running around. So, uh, you know, we're talking about surrendering for your family. Mm-hmm. And this is how Claire is surrendering. She's surrendering for this idea of family. She's surrendering for Brie. I mm-hmm. mean, think about it. It's not just about Claire. Had Claire come back through the stones not pregnant, she might not, probably not, would have stayed with Frank. Oh, yeah, probably. Claire can hang by herself. Yeah. But she has this baby. She has this baby, and Frank wants to raise this baby as their own. So Claire is surrendering a huge portion of herself, a huge portion of her identity, of her freedom, of of who she thinks she could be. And I'm so glad that she gets that back by join, by going to med school. So we'll get back to that. So um, Jamie, of course, it's pretty obvious how Jamie surrenders himself for mm-hmm. his family. I mean, first off, right. he hides in a cave for the better part of six years. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> the very limited interaction that cave was pimped out i'm glad it was i don't know how winters would be in it good luck jamie are you happy that they had the time jump for jamie like all of a sudden it was jamie is alone in this cave and you see the, see him with the, with the hair and the bad beard like add on okay. okay so if you are being called Dunbonnet because you wear a brown bonnet to hide your red hair, then hide your flipping red hair, Jamie. Right. That was like Whoa. crazy humidity, like what I have before I get my keratin treatment every <laughs> summer. That was crazy frizz fro, okay? And it's not like he had it braided. It's not like he had it cut. Like he could cut it with a knife. We know he has plenty of tools. We saw him gut that fish. I know. Come on, man. Cut your hair, Jamie. If you're known as Red Jamie... Like, cut your flipping hair. Like, I love how he finally cuts it and shaves at the end. And I'm like, that would have saved you a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. No one would refer to you as yet Red Jamie if they didn't see. Like, he has this little mini hat. Like, a little, <laughs> little mini hat. And then locks of love. Like, he could donate that. Right. <laughs> Even his it. beard hair he could have donated. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, he's surrendering his family by – he's surrendering for his family. He's not coming out. He, of course – uh, goes and visits. I agree that he visited way too frequently in this episode. I kind of felt lot. like, kind of felt like Jamie didn't really live in a cave that he would like pretend <laughs> but that he'd really just like come hang out and eat the food and hang out in the warmth. Um, we <laughs> like all know he, would, he didn't. It's like our cat. Like he'd go out for the day. Yeah, he'd go. He'd like go out and go hunt and be like, oh, I'm gonna be like so badass. Bring back you some. Know, bring back some dead look stuff. Look at me, I'm wilderness. But really, he's like <laughs> sleeping in the kid's bed. <laughs> <laughs> he kicks young Jamie out and he's like, Don't tell your mom. <laughs> Get on the floor, kid. Braid my hair. Um... <laughs> okay, so <laughs> So anyway. Um oh, But God. we see him, I mean he comes and uh the baby's born. He tries to keep the baby quiet. I am surprised. I mean, obviously, I had to follow along with the books, but like, you know, in, in this term of surrendering, like how quiet, quiet he had to be, how he couldn't even fight these couple of soldiers that were in his house. He mm. had to surrender to that and know that he cannot do this for his family. And then, of course, at the end, I mean, it's so simple. He like gives himself up. So his family will stop being hassled by these people. will also get the money that they so desperately need. Right, right. Ian, let's talk Ian. I really liked Ian in this one. Oh, my God, yes. And I liked it because he's talking – I mean, first of all, I, I thought the way that he handled – Talking in terms of surrendering. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, no, go, no, no, go, no, go. No, 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 I'm letting you go. I like yeah. the way that he handled it. He, he was just like, okay, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going. It's, it's going to be another visit. Like, it, it's clearly – again, visual storytelling. It's clearly something that's happened many times, and he's just, okay, all right, man, like, let's, let's go again. I'll be back. You know, we'll take care of it. Um, but then again, we also have this great moment, this 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 really heartwarming moment between both he and Jamie. Yeah, he's talking about oh, his leg and you know and and uh, Fergus's hand. It's gonna he's gonna feel like this. But you, this is your heart. Yeah, I I can't even imagine that. Claire was your heart. Mm-hmm. Oh, just a stunning scene. Great writing. And also shows you the depth of which Ian loves Jenny. Like, I feel like when a guy can express feelings of that depth, when anyone can express feelings of that depth of love, it's because they too have been able to experience it. 
And mm-hmm. obviously they love each other mm-hmm. a lot because they have babies every single episode. Yeah, 18 kids <laughs> running around somewhere. I like how like, they're like, the baby's coming soon. You just hear Jenny moaning. She doesn't need anybody's help anymore. Yeah, she just does it herself. Yeah. Like she's got a baseball mitt and she just catches it. She's got the birthing mat on the floor and the, and the guy comes up and he's like, did you just give birth again? She's like, yeah. She's it, like, yes. She was in great shape, by this the way. This is what I do. Great shape. Where's my whiskey? She was like, yeah, she's just sitting there. The, the wig. The wig was terrible. Jenny's wig. Jenny's wig needs to calm down. That was really, I, uh, I couldn't stop looking at it. I know. That was the one thing that took away from Laura Donnelly. I think they bought it at Party City. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was distracting. And she was so brilliant. And you're like, <clears throat> oh, God, that wig. It's almost distracting, as distracting as Jamie's bad beard. That That's just saying, by the way. Jamie, by the way, I kept on thinking of Jeremiah Johnson. You know, ever see that uh, Robert Redford movie? What? No. <laughs> You love Robert Redford. What is going on? I do love Robert I Redford. I know you do. I don't. No, he's like the old Tom Cruise. I'm all set with these people. Like, <laughs> you literally are in every Tom single movie. Cruise. Yes. Tom Cruise is like in every single movie. I'm like, retire. Be gone. Bye. Oh, my God. Robert Redford was the same way in every single movie. Leave me alone. Jeremiah, it's when Robert Redford lives, lives in the woods and he fights a bear. And How it, about it... My Side of the Mountain? That's more my speed. <laughs> Loved that book. Oh, okay. Anyway, so Ian sac- surrendering himself and doing it so jolly. Like, I just love how Ian does it and how he handles himself in front of the kids, how he handles himself in front of the boys. Like, mm-hmm. no, 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 it's all good. Thank you, gentlemen, for the nice stay. You know, he is surrendering a lot of his dignity. You know, to yeah. have to be like, oh, here we go again. Nope, sure. Come on and take me. And leaving his family, leaving his pregnant wife, that is way too much for me, oh. leaving his pregnant wife, leaving his kids. And it's not easy. I mean, think about it. A lot of the people who would have been helping out in this house are gone. All we see is Mary. Mm-hmm. So I just big props to Ian uh, I, for surrendering I, yes. for the sake of his family. I really loved Ian in this episode. And Stephen Cree, good looking man. Oh my gosh. Never really noticed that. Until Not going to lie. So I got to meet him at the Outlander in the City event. Mm-hmm. And he was all over the place. He was very outgoing. He was a uh, chatterbox. He was um, very, very extroverted, to say the least. Uh-huh. And to see him in this role again, like in, a, in an episode that is brand new to me, um, I finally saw a little shine of Steven. I was like, Steven is such a good actor. Cause that is not how Steven is. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's just so di- it's a very different personalities, but he did such a great job. Right. He, he did. did such a great job. He did. Jenny, how, I mean, we've already talked about Jenny a bit, but how do you think she surrendered for the better of her family? Uh, well, she surrendered her child, uh, a, a brand new, the baby was about, Oh, 17 seconds old. And she's handing it off to Jamie. And, you know, you had this one like heart attack moment uh, when Jamie had the baby in his arms and the British officers are in the room and he's trying to quiet the baby and he takes out his knife. And you're like, is he going to do something bad? Is he going to do something like really? Aw-? And then and then like it was just that, you know, you get that from Game of Thrones. Remember that in like season one or two when they killed the baby and you're like, oh, you know, like, yes. That's what it, but then he, but then you realize yeah. no it's just he's taking it out to fight the guys and the british soldiers and by the way speaking of that it just shows you the kind of power that the british have over uh, the scottish people or the english soldiers have over the scottish people they're just literally going into people's houses they're they and they're, it's also giving you a little bit of a history lesson in that you have to surrender any weapons to the british uh to the british mm-hmm, army mm-hmm. you just have to surrender them sorry uh, you can't have anything so it, it's giving you a little bit of historical back knowledge on what is actually happening in this time people are just walking in houses demanding to see where red jamie is they, these people have no real personal liberties after oh, no. that rebellion it is gone and also i don't know if you noticed but like um so like kilts and and just the the bagpipes i mean we talked about the bagpipes last episode how just that is now gone from the opening music because bagpipes were outlawed mm. and how important it was in this episode for Claire to hear those bagpipes. Um, and even just for the, the kilts and, and the plaid to be shown that wasn't allowed anymore either. Fergus snuck it in a little bit. Yes, he, he snuck did. It. He's such a little, <laughs> he's <laughs> next. How did Fergus <laughs> surrender for his family? Oh, because this is, I think Fergus's he surrendered family. his hand. 
<laughs> Sorry. That's you, know, just, you walked into that one. Like, the thing that I love about Fergus is I feel like Fergus is me. Like, if I had a spirit animal for Outlander, I mm-hmm. think it'd be Fergus. Why? Because I totally act brashly. I will neither confirm nor deny this. I'm sentiment. saying it. I'm okay. saying it. I would have been like, you know what? Screw these British soldiers. I found a gun and I'm totally going to do it. And I can let's, you know what? Let's go slit their throats at night. And you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go run my mouth off and give these people a piece of my mind <laughs> and run around the woods because that's so fun. And that's so maniacal. And you're not going to catch me. And I, that's me. That's me, except like I'm a work from home mom who really doesn't get to do too much, except, you know, tell on my neighbors for their barking dog and call animal control and be like, hey, I told on them. Like, that's really it. But I feel like if I lived in this day and age, I would act like Fergus. I would be like, the rebellion isn't done. I'm ready for the next one. Yeah, you know, sign me up. I found Fergus to be a little bit contradictory uh, in this episode. And I say that because of his reaction to killing a guy in Preston Pans in the season that shall not be named, except for Preston Pans and Dragonfly and Amber. Um, in this episode, and maybe it's just a boy being a boy and remembering back and being like, I'm all tough in front of other kids. And I, and I get that because, you know, I did that. I've done it. And, you know, um, it was like Stranger Things. <laughs> Those boys hanging out in the like, I don't know. What were those? It was like the Owlery at Hogwarts, but for pigeons. You're a wizard, Harry. What was that place? I don't know. I, where it they... was like it was like what you put your shoes in when you go bowling. <laughs> shoe cubbies. Little cubbies. All sorts of shoe cubbies for all of Jenny's hundreds of children. <laughs> I I think Fergus. I think he feels a sense of ownership over Jamie. He calls he still calls him my lord, and I love that scene when he looks at Jamie and says, "Oh." There's my lord. When when Jamie says I have something to fight for after he gets gets his hand cut off, which I would hope that it wouldn't take your hand getting cut off to kind of jigger you back into into life. But hey, you know what? It's okay. I'm just I'm just saying. I love that scene, but I, I feel like Fergus is overcompensating for himself and for Jamie, and he's trying to be. Uh, cool and he's trying to be tough yeah and i get that i just feel like it's he was he was a little traumatized after preston pans and now all of a sudden he's saying i wish i could oh go my back God, i didn't even add preston pans is the reason why he needs a therapist <laughs> exactly right mm. and he's saying he wants to go back and kill all the guys and he wants to keep the rebellion going and even and james saying there's no more rebellion and there's no red flags going off that this little boy needs a journal right he <laughs> He needs to journal Every his journal. emotions. He needs like the composition book. Yes. <laughs> Gosh. Fergus. Be still my heart, Fergus. I know like that it was both of our bads with the whole like taunting and everything. But, but, um, I, but I, I love Fergus's character because yes, yes, he should have just thrown a rock at the bloody crow. But you know what? You know what a little boy would do? Something stupid. Something really stupid. He knew where the gun was and kid had a great aim he did i wouldn't have been able to do that no me neither no chance cheers to fergus Here, and your cheers. Aim. there we go getting that crow i i the other thing Keeping baby ian alive the other thing about fergus too is you know he i really liked actually the the moment when they cut his hand off uh i felt like that was something that a petty little something that Corporal McGregor would do just to be like, F this kid. He's been taunting me all week, and now I've had it, and I can do whatever I want because I'm an English bad boy, even though he's from Scotland. I like that. I like that there is something taken from this group. I like that it's not all just peachy keen. It's Mm -hmm. still very dangerous. It's real. It's real six years after Mm Culloden. It's still real. But I do feel like, and I and I know I've said this. I said that it was, it was most of it was character driven, and I feel like the act itself of cutting his hand off was something that a character of that nature would do. Like these these, if you want to put it in air quotes, evil British soldiers would do. 
Um, and it feels like something that Fergus would do is taunt these guys and run away. Uh, but I also feel like Fergus serves as a little bit of like um, a plot device for Jamie. If you know what I mean, uh, like in season two, the, the one that shall not be named. Fergus had a run in with Black Jack Randall. Yeah. And that is the thing that propels Jamie to go fight Black Jack Randall yes. in the duel. And it kind of kicks him into that gear. And now we have this other thing that kind of just kicks Jamie into gear, which is Fergus has his hand lost. And now he says, I have something to fight for now. I remember what it's like. It just feels like a, a device for me. Like, oh, oh, it's another thing that happens to Fergus. Fergus is Jamie's son. Right. Fergus is Jamie's family. And, um. Yes. Yes. Talking about family. Yes, I would agree. I would agree. I, I just, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's, it's just, it, they, they need, they have to find a way to get Jamie back. How do they get Jamie back? Okay, let's cut Fergus's hand off. Like, I, I don't know. It, no, it's, it's not just that. It's, it's that the British keep coming. The British keep coming and bothering everyone at Lollybrock that they never will stop. This is six years out. He's yes. literally been hiding in a cave and they are still coming. They're coming and bothering his sister who literally just gave birth. They don't even have the decency to leave a woman postpartum to, okay, we're going to take your word from it. We've asked you a million times and we've taken your husband a million times. No. So Jamie knows it's not just Fergus. Right. It's his family. It's his whole family, Fergus included. And I, I do like the fact that Jamie does get back out of it. And he does, he recognizes that there is danger to his family. He, he, something really bad happens and that's Fergus getting his hand cut off. It's something really bad could have happened with the 17 second year old baby uh, with, with Jenny. It really, so it's a natural progression for Jamie to be like, I have to surrender myself by the way, pat myself on the back here a little bit. Bam. Just like that. A winner. My theory came true. Which it was, one? Jamie and Jenny planned his surrender from the beginning. I knew it. I knew that was going to happen because there's no way Jenny is willingly giving her brother up for, for the British. It just, it's never going to happen. Good job, Blake. So you know what? I'm, Good just, job. I'm just awesome. I, I just have to say that. I just have to say that. How hard would it be to see, you know, someone who you care about say brother for years Six years. Yep. And feel like he wasn't even there. Uh, and, and she specifically said so. James Fraser hasn't been here for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and that that says a lot about those two. Um, it says a lot about Jamie, where he has been. And I kind of wish that we had a little bit more with Jamie being in solitude. Uh, just silent. Like they did a great job with him, not saying anything, nonverbal, just kind of grunting along. I wish we kind of just seen him do things alone for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so you get that feeling because you're right. He did visit Lily Brock like a lot, and yeah. he just kind of like showed up and with a deer. Like, hey, I got this two hundred pound pound. Like, what deer did you do when you weren't hunting? Right. Like, what what was going on with you? Did you cave paint? But I will say that they're... Make baskets? They got 13 episodes. They don't got a lot of real estate here. So they got to get to it. And I know there's a lot more to come. So... You ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, hold on. This this is for you. You know nothing, Jon Snow. I'm so glad you got it in. That's our new sound drop. Good job. <laughs> Good job. All right. So I, I but I, I'm I'm happy that we did get to see Sam portray Jamie as this alone, nonverbal kind of caveman, like literally caveman. I just wish we got a chance to see a little bit more of it. Um I I had a couple of more pants off moments, I'm not gonna lie. I still don't understand this comment. I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> At the beginning of the episode, they've been doing this thing, even since Dragonfly and Amber, when the two characters are looking out and like Claire looks out and she sees Jamie and, and, and underneath like the uh, the archway in Dragonfly and Amber, right? And then Jamie sees Claire walking up the battlefield in, in, in the premiere. And now they're both seeing each other. Like Jamie walks up 
And as he's looking at Jenny, he himself is seeing Claire. And I, I just thought that was amazing. And even Claire, Claire getting busy uh, with herself, <laughs> thinking about getting Jamie. With it. But um, even like looking over at the bed and looking over to Frank and still seeing Jamie, mm. those things are really like silent. Those things are really, that's good filmmaking. That was beautiful. Good visual storytelling. Yeah. They, I, I do feel like they lingered a little bit too long on each other. Like I, I almost wish that it was like a, a blink and you'll miss thing where they hint at the fact that it was uh, Claire, you know, there instead of Jenny. Like, yeah. I wish they just turned her face a little bit. You saw Claire, but then like all of a sudden it was, it was Jenny again. And then I do wish, you know, I liked it actually that it was staring because it made me feel like he is so lost that he's literally yeah. staring, thinking it's her. Another thing too, I wish they that kind it. of happened was Claire walked over. I'm, I'm sorry, walked over, looked over in the bed and she saw if it was actually Jamie in the bed with her for just a brief second. Do you know what I mean? Instead of him being like in a bed and like all totally differently lit and everything, yeah. I just wish that he was actually in, in the, the 1940s bed, bed. In the 1940s bed with her. Like that would have been freaking awesome. I've been talking about this show Turn lately uh, on AMC and they do some stuff like that where characters are thinking of other characters and they're in the scene with them but they're they're not there in reality, but they're there. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's very interesting that they do that I wish that had kind of happened in this episode. But I love, I still, regardless, love that they're seeing each other. Their lives are parallel. Things are happening that are similar to them, mm -hmm. similar to each other, and they're seeing each other all the while. I, I, I it's just br yeah. beautiful filmmaking. What did you think about Claire getting busy and oh, and and then like. I miss my husband. Oh. Is she referring to Frank or is she referring Let's to Jamie? Talk. Let's switch gears. Okay. Let's switch gears from family to sex. Let's do it. Getting jiggy with it. <laughs> Yay for sex. Nay for all of the sex with whom it was with. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited um, that they brought the sensuality back to Outlander. Obviously, that was something that was dramatically missing in season two. But of course, nobody who we want to be having sex with each other is having sex with each other. So, right. um, okay. Claire masturbating. I mean, I'm just, once again, seeing this on Facebook live. I hope my mom doesn't watch this. Um, <laughs> thinking of Jamie while her husband, Frank is laying next to her. How real and sad. And this is a, um, God. I, I, I like it. I, <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to say it like that. I think it's good. I think it's good uh, visually. I think it's, I think it's stimulating visually. Um, I just kept thinking about how, <laughs> oh God, after having two babies, like it's just a whole different <laughs> land. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I I think, I think the sex in this entire episode, I, Outlander does sex, a lot differently than really any other TV show I've ever seen. I would completely agree, but I'm excited to hear why you think that. Um, I, I think it because, again, it's... it's uh, I have a love-hate relationship with it, okay? With what? The sex? With the sex in Outlander. In this Be season or in general? No, in general. Oh. Um, like, th th the scene that I always refer back to is the opening shot of one of the episodes, forgive me, I don't remember, but, you know... Jamie's going down on, on Claire. That's how this, the episode opens. And I just felt like that was just gratuitous. It, there's no reason to have this. It doesn't serve anything in the story. But then there are other parts to Outlander and the sex that do serve the story. When Claire and Frank are in the... Do you think all of the sex in this episode served? Or do you think there's something in yes. this? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Good, good. Right. That's why all sex right. so, was my good. You know what? I'll get back. I'll get away from We're on this episode. One. Talk to me about this, this episode. episode. Right. We're talking about the masturbating. We have the masturbating scene. thinking about scene, Jamie. And he gets the little bum. And... Well done. It's great. Good job on those exercises. Yeah. <laughs> Keep doing lunges, brother. But it's showing you... That he's not gone. That she still is 100% attracted to And Jamie. the only way that she can have him is by remembering him. But the thing is, it's just not enough. 
for well, Claire. And it's awkward. Yeah, well, I mean, she was being a little vocal. I mean, I feel like it Frank reminds- must be a, like a really heavy sleeper. It's like when you're in college and you have a roommate <laughs> and you're like, I really hope they can't hear me. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope they don't know what's going on. Oh, my God. I went there, but you all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so that scene going on. Uh, then we have I miss my husband. So she gets all. Uh, here, here's, the, here's the difference. Here's the difference. And this is, this, is, this is the big thing. This is why it serves the story perfectly. There's a difference between sex and how long, intimacy. Okay? There's a difference between getting busy with yourself and being one with somebody, okay? Being intimate, like being being together. And yes, she can go back and think about Jamie and yeah, she can pleasure herself and yeah, great. All all that's fantastic. But it's just Yeah, so great. All that's fantastic. Claire needs more than yes. just physical pleasure. The she intimacy. needs intimacy. And that's why when she says, I miss my husband, she mm. may be talking about Frank. No. But maybe she's talking about Jamie. Yes. But either way. Wait, are you saying maybe because, like, you don't know? I don't specifically know. Stop it. But she's looking for intimacy. She can't get intimacy from Jamie. We saw that. So she's saying, I miss my husband because I can be intimate with my husband. And she can't run to dildo anymore. (laughs) It's not season two. (laughs) So that's what I'm getting at. Like, you can't be intimate with a dildo, okay? You can't be intimate. Just, you know. Facebook's going to kick us off. I know. You can be intimate with another person if you have a connection with that person. Frank is her husband. And I'm not saying, in my heart of hearts, I think she's talking about Jamie. I miss my husband. You are the vehicle that I can imagine as my husband as we're trying to be intimate. And which ultimately probably proves itself. Because as she's making love to Frank, she does have this moment when she realizes intimacy with Frank isn't intimate it's just still sexual pleasure and it's only sexual pleasure because she doesn't have that connection with frank and this is where i understand claire because you cannot be intimate with someone who you know necessarily isn't your one true love you can be you can be be physically pleasured you can physically pleasure You can love, perhaps. You can have this platonic relationship. You can have even this relationship that is uh, symbiotic and one that is of a team, maybe raising your child. But you'll never be intimate, which is why she closes her eyes and imagines Jamie. When even when when even when Frank is saying, "Open your eyes, look at me." Open your eyes, please. Just... So you get so you get that she was saying, because I think there's like 99% of me that's like she was obviously talking about Jamie. But then there's that little percent of me that has Claire saying, not just I miss my husband, like I miss the simplicity of what life once was. Like, I, not I miss. Like Claire's trying. There's that 1% that Claire is trying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, that, I don't, one part of me, in her most mind, of me it's thinks it's, it's all Jamie. Jamie, but maybe there's just that one chance. It's the one percent that says this is okay to say out loud because there's one percent of your mind that like wants to want Frank this way. It's okay, brain. Sure, you go get him, Tiger. You want to live in America and raise Brie and 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 do all this and be a stay at home mom. Yes, and maybe it's yes. a new beginning, like I said. That one percent. It's that one percent that is meaning it about Frank. Mm-hmm. I'm trying for Frank. I'm here. I'm doing the grunt work. I'm I'm doing this. It's the one percent, but it's ninety nine percent, Jamie. We all know it is. And that's why I'm saying, I can't one hundred percent say it's Jamie. And that's why I also give Claire credit in this episode because she is – she's giving a lot more uh, attention to this notion that perhaps this is a new beginning. You, you, you see her make an effort for Frank and make an effort for herself and like, make an effort for that relationship. And, like, I try to think about 
if anyone who who's listening, who's watching has been in those relationships where you're like, this, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good in this relationship. There's a lot of reasons why I should stay in this relationship and it's not working. It's not clicking, but maybe if I try, yeah. maybe if I try, if I, give it a shot. I can do it. And it's that 1% that I'm talking about. It's the, let, let me try just a little bit more before we break. Right. Right. And Kendra, Kendra is just here. She actually on the Facebook live says, Hi, uh, these are complex issues. Yes. That is an understatement. And w- what we're saying here probably gives it zero justice. The, the things that are going on between Frank and Claire, zero justice. What does give it justice is that one moment between them as the camera switches to a wide shot. And yeah. you see the two beds. And I'm wondering about anyone who's listening who is divorced, you know, who or who as in one of these relationships that is completely estranged. So my parents were together for 22 years. I'm being honest. Once again, if my mom's still watching by this point, I am so not invited to Christmas. <laughs> After all um, the dildo talk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, OK, so my parents were together for 22 years. OK, my parents, to my recollection, never slept in the same bed. I had a relationship, what you got to see at that last shot with my parents, not even in the same room, was in a separate bed. Mm -hmm. My parents tried and tried and tried for the sake of their children. Mm -hmm. Claire and Frank are trying, mostly from Claire's perspective, for the sake of Brie. For the sake of doing what Jamie asked her to promise of him. So I'm just I'm just thinking of because Blake and I are not divorced. Thank God. You know, but like <laughs> Yeah, I'm what would thinking, you do without me? No, but I'm just thinking about the people that have been or have just been through those relationships where it's like, this is not clicking. This is not good. Right. But let's just try. And if I have to pretend that you are somebody else while we make love, then at least we're making love. At least we're doing something. Mm-hmm. And at least I can tell myself I miss my husband. So I know we're going to move on. I, 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 I will say this. I'm glad they didn't go that terrible TV movie trope when they're in the throes of passion. And all of a sudden, she says the wrong name. <gasps> oh, gee. Like, I'm so happy they didn't go that route. I was nervous they were going I was, to. I, I was, was nervous, so too. Nervous. Like, I was, I was, I was like cringing in my feet just yeah. waiting for it. Like, I was getting cramps. I was like, oh, my God, please don't, please don't. And they never did. They never did. And they did it in that subtle way of just having her eyes closed. But she the- couldn't open them. And that really killed me for him because I thought, okay, Claire, like we get it. We get it. We know what you're doing. And she couldn't, at wo- she couldn't even force herself to open her right, eyes. Right. And that killed me for Frank. I felt so bad for Frank in that moment yep. because she couldn't even fake it by that point. <laughs> that like, yeah, sure. I'm thinking about you, honey. Oops. Nope. And that's when he calls her out. And rightly so. It's, it's hard to not blame him for calling her out, being like, hey, whoa, when you're with me, I'm with you, but you're always with him. I, and I don't get it. Can you? And, and, and as much as I am hashtag Team Frank, this one bothered me a little bit. And I get where he's coming from. I get it. And and when you're in the throes of it, I, I understand how you say bad things. You say stupid things. They did it last episode. It happened again. But Frank, buddy, come on. Like, I understand that you're you're making love to your wife and it feels great and and you want her to look at you and passionately. But how can you just expect her to just – this is like from what we know of as yeah. viewers. This is the second time that this has happened. Yeah, that they've had sex. Which is great. Thank yes, you. Thank it, awesome. I amazing. I agree with you. I'd kind of be like, Frank, just shut up. Like, just shut the hell up, brother. connecting with you in some way, shape, or form. Like, just keep it going. And that's why I'm saying they have this mutual respect. At least I imagine that they do. Build on that. She finally allowed this kind of physical, intimate relationship. Mm-hmm. Shut the hell up now. Shut up. We all know Claire is a very sexual woman. Let her... Be her. She is your wife. You are the only person she is currently sleeping with because she's back from the stone. I don't think she's not with Jamie. So just just know that because Claire wouldn't just do this because she's horny. Claire wouldn't just do this because she wants to imagine Jamie. Mm -hmm. She is. It's that it's that little percentage that is trying that knows. All right. I love being physically intimate. 
I have a husband here. I want the husband there, but this husband here will do and I'll pretend it's the other husband. <laughs> you know, I just no, I get it. I get it. And it just um it 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 was tough. Um can we talk about the sex scene between Mary I hate saying this between Mary and Jamie? Let's call her Ms. McNabb. <laughs> okay, Ms. McNabb. You just don't want to picture me having sex with Jamie, right? No, I don't. I'm not I'm not into that. You don't that. want to be frank. You Some... don't want to feel like you're <laughs> no, frank. No, no, I refuse to be frank, even though I'm hashtag team frank. The other thing that I really loved about this was that <sighs> Outlander so far has been one has been a show that has defined its sex scenes by intimacy. Mm-hmm. It's something that has been shared by two people that are trying to connect in a very uh, physical, spiritual, emotional, loving way. And in the second sex scene, and the sex scene, I'm sorry, in the second sex scene between Claire and Frank, and this sex scene between Ms. McNabb and Jamie. Both by fire late, by the way. <laughs> so sensual. Uh, it feels similar in that it's just about two people. For Frank, it's more than that. But for Claire, it's just about. I need to feel something. I need to feel something other than what I'm feeling. And and for the two, Jamie and Ms. McNabb, it feels the same. It feels like we are two lonely people. It yes. doesn't have to be this passionate thing. It doesn't, it's just, it's just about two people that need connection. It's just about two people that need to do something different. No strings attached. Do you know what I'm singing? No, I don't. You're not an NSYNC fan? <laughs> no, I'm not. Just, you know what? Keep going. How's that sound? <laughs> no. But that's it. It was no strings attached. Warmth and kindness. Um, and I just, I think, I think Mary handled it with such grace. Right. I, I think so, too, because uh, she just wanted, she wanted it because it hasn't happened. And, and Jamie with the tear. You know, um, oh, you know, I, and how he says, I haven't done this in right. a while. There you go. You can play this under those of you who are from my generation, you know, this song. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is, I think this was my favorite. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and it feels weird because both Claire and Jamie are having are sleeping with someone who we don't want them to be sleeping with. But I just really loved it. The how how Mary came to him, how Mary was kind to him, how she was gentle with him, he with her and how she said, you can look at me if you want to. Like he didn't even know what to do. He probably felt so awkward. He wanted to close his eyes for a little bit. But how different it was that parallel of like eyes open, eyes shut. Oh, great parallel. And there's lots of parallels in this episode. This whole sh- this whole episode was parallel. I, and and th- this season has done a great job showing the parallel lives uh, between between Claire and Jamie and how they're living their lives. I mean, uh, I mean, the timeline is a little funky because Jamie is years ahead, whereas Claire is only about a year, a couple of years ahead. You know what I mean? If that, not even, uh, maybe six months ahead. Um, so they're not showing the same exact amount of time happening in between each, mm-hmm. each life. Uh, but I, I, I love the fact that Jamie recognized that he was kind of becoming inhuman he was i mean he's eating raw fish he's killing deers he's like you know that raw fish you know he's he's jeremiah johnson (laughs) (laughs) he's jeremiah johnson over here or he's Gollum. okay that's who i was too um this connection this physical connection is what makes him somewhat human again and Mm -hmm. i'm i'm also glad that we didn't have to watch it and that's the that's the beautiful thing about this season so far. The filmmaking has been so subtle. Yes. And the filmmaking has had visual storytelling this entire time, this for this yes. season. Whereas this in the season that shall not be named. Yes. It the was Voldemort. just it was like it was so um it was just so in your face. And they were trying so hard to tell you. And they were like 
even season one a little bit with all the voiceovers. By the way, the first voiceover of the season. Oh my gosh, episode. her looking at that knife. I was like, don't Claire, stop. I know. Stop voiceovering, Claire. We don't need to know. Oh, well, okay. We committed. Um, yeah, well, oh, oh, it's happening. All right, fine. The filmmaking this season has been so subtle. And that is why this season has been far superior to season two already. Already. It's just so much better. Let's just talk real quick about this Joe Abernathy character. You could tell immediately. Oh, do you like that in the, the Google notes? I titled this section. So we went from family to sex to do your job. Yeah, <laughs> please do give me, your job. Give me your best Bill Belichick impression. No, you do it. No, 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 no. no. I can't. I can't. No, no days off. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Be the jack job. about you were meant to be or yes. be the Scotsman or be the husband or be the brother that you were meant to be. Be the doctor, be the med student that you were meant to be. Right. I don't see these two becoming romantically involved. I see them becoming Joe as, Abernathy and Claire. Right. Okay. I I see them being like buddies. Like why? They're they're biffles. I'm looking off, but yes, tell me more. Why? Uh, I see them becoming biffles because uh they're in their in this world, in this white male old guy dominated world, they are minorities, both of them, especially in the, the, the medical field. And they're only going to have each other to rely on. Uh, I'm sure that there are going to be things where somebody sabotages Claire's uh, efforts to become a doctor, or perhaps somebody sabotages Joe Abernathy's character from becoming a doctor. Kendra says... They are both outlanders. Oh, zinger. Bam. Just like that. A winner. Uh, they're, they're both outlanders, and they both rely on each other. And I look forward, because just, just seeing them, like seeing them walk into the room, I got a good feeling. I got a really good feeling about mm -hmm. this guy. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is somebody that we're going to come to know. We're going to rely on as viewers. We're going to like them. And it's going to be a great relationship. So I look forward to seeing how this evolves. What are you laughing? What are you uh, laughing for? One of my one of my show notes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, please continue with your show notes. We were talking about all the parallels. Yes. And then I found something that was completely opposite, and I needed to point this out to everybody. Mm -hmm. How flippin' hairy, or as we say on this show, how frackin' hairy <laughs> Jamie was. So say we all. And how wax chested Frank was. <laughs> I was Total like, opposite. Ah, where's your, oh, yeah, no, wasn't expecting that. <laughs> dolphin smooth, that, that man. <laughs> He's going full dolphin. <laughs> That's my little fun fact. So. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I look forward to Joe. I do, I, I really do look forward to Joe. We'll see, we'll see how, how that goes along. Uh, Is there any other points that you wanted to bring up? Now, mind you, of course, everyone listening, we do do a second episode this week. So, of course, there's tons of stuff that we can still do. Yeah, I'm trying into. to remember anything that we didn't hit on. And I, I, I think we've we've hit on pretty much all of it. Uh we hit on the baby, we hit on Joe Abernathy, we hit on the sex scenes, we hit on the dinner party. Um so on that note, we're gonna take a quick break. Yes. Let's do it and let's talk about our sponsor for um this episode. We wanted to remind you all that this episode of Outlander Cast is brought to you by the Muse Studios on Etsy. They seriously have all of the best Outlander shirts on the internet. Well, maybe except ours. <laughs> so it's run by Nicole and her mom. I mean, that just melts my heart. And not only are they super nice, accommodating, and they get you the orders out super, super fast, but they also take the time to chat with you and find the absolute right choice for any purchase you make. So I want you to take a look at the site. It is Etsy.com. There's, I mean, there's. Oh, wait, you, you, we have a different one. We have Muse, the Muse Studios. Well, e e dot Etsy.com. Well, they're, they're both. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It takes you to the same place regardless. Okay, so I want you to go to the Muse Studios dot Etsy dot com. And they have a great bunch of Outlander shirts here. Beautiful Outlander shirts. I mean, take me home to Lallybrock, and they have the Jamp one. Uh, they, they have so many great shirts and. I'm just dealing with Nicole uh, has been amazing. I've ordered some shirts from her, working, and it came doing. in. I've been working, but you know, working, chatting, with, just chatting. Kibitzing. And the shirts came within like a couple of days. It was it was just phenomenal. 
just to work with her. And this is the time when you want to rock your Outlander pride. You want to go to the gym. You want to go see your friends. You want to hang out on Sunday nights in an Outlander shirt. So definitely check it out. Once again, themusestudios.etsy.com. Use the coupon code OUTLANDER30, meaning Outlander30, okay? Outlander30 for 30% off your total order off of the best Outlander shirts there are on the interwebs. That's right. As for now, my darling, you ready to get into the listener G? B G. You bet. Let's do it. All right. This comes straight from Joanne Felchi. She gives it three kilts. Three kilts. Really? Good. The feisty, though not very wise Fergus. The bad, the wigs, Ian, Jenny, long redheaded Jamie, and the <laughs> great silent Sam. Amazing emotional range without many words. I, Sam Hewen has killed it this season so far yes he's 100%. been amazing as much as i love tobias menzies no sam is sam, sam is, has been great yeah. tori Hilligan says kilt rating was 4.25 the good was joe i really hope they do more with this character than in the book he was one of my faves the bad was the return of that awful beard amen and the great was i love the juxtaposition of how claire and jamie both are trying to cope without each other claire with her sexuality and marriage to frank and jamie with the silence i loved that beat when she wouldn't open her eyes to Frank, but Jamie could from Aaron McNabb. Can't wait for next week. And Sue Campbell Deacon says, my kill rating is a 4.5. Oh, my God. It was good being back at Lollybrock. Despite the Redcoats' presence, my bad was, I'm sorry, but I just didn't buy the scenes with Fergus. Mm. We all love him in France, but he just seems like a little kid. I, he's supposed to be six or seven years later. And perhaps I've read Voyager one too many times, but I was <laughs> almost distracted by how closely... Some of the scenes followed the book, especially the bedside with Jamie and Fergus. I like it when they change things up a little bit. And my great was Sam Hewen's acting. He has conveyed such depth of emotion in the last two episodes with so few words. And the appearance of his lovely rear end in Claire's dream wasn't that bad either. <laughs> you know what, Sue? I can care. I would agree with you on that one. I, these are all great uh, GBGs. Fantastic. Yes. Love yes. them all. But you know what we're really looking forward to yes. right now? It's time for the Kendra Thought of the week. Oh, sorry. Got the wrong thing. This is when Facebook Live is fun and you get to see the editing <laughs> process. Hold on. Blake's bringing it up. Don't you worry. And Kendra, this. who this recording is, is here live in the chat, I think, still. We're going to have to make a spot here. Okay, sorry, guys. Oh, my we're... gosh, where is it? Here it is. I got it right here. Oh, okay. Hey, Mary and Blake. So this was another strong episode, but not as strong as last week. I really enjoyed the arc we get with Jamie. Sam Hewen really does fully embody the beastliness inherent in living in a cave for seven years. Moving on to Jenny for a moment, I have complicated feelings for her character. I've always appreciated her strength as a woman. However, some of her behavior throughout the series is pretty off-putting. Despite this, I loved Jenny in this episode. Laura Donnelly is incredible and manages to walk away with the episode. Her prodding in regards to Mary McNabb comes as genuine concern, something that doesn't read quite so strongly in the book. I'll just give it time, though, because my serious Jenny Iyer started in earnest in Voyager, so we won't be braiding each other's hair just yet. <laughs> the showdown between Jenny and the Redcoat soldiers after young Ian's birth was absolutely intense. And with Sam's literal caveman performance, when he draws a dagger while hiding with Ian, I had a momentary flash of terror for the infant before the rational part of my brain took over, and I realized he was preparing to fight redcoats, not silence a crying baby. I loved Ferguson's episode as well, and the moment between him and Jamie after he loses his hand is extremely touching. Claire had her moment with Fergus last season in Preston Pans when she realized she had been given a second chance to be a mother with Fergus. And Jamie gets that same realization here, only it's much more meaningful with Jamie because Fergus is literally all he has. Watching the episode last night with my husband when the actual assault takes place, he reacted viscerally. He said, you can't even just call them evil anymore. That's just monstrous. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. It's one thing to read it and another thing to see it. First, it's amazing how much Roman Burrow, I think that's how you pronounce his name, I'm not sure, sure has not? aged since last season. 
But at the same time, when you see Jamie trying to stem the bleeding, Fergus' arm looks so tiny in his hand, emphasizing Fergus' childish fragility, even in the face of his own bra uh, bravado. Moving on to Claire and Frank, this is where I have really mixed feelings. Tobias and Kate both do an incredible job here with what they're given. However, it's one thing to give a more sympathetic view of Frank and quite another to actively change a character's emotional trajectory. With the first episode, I understood the writer's vision to see both sides of an emotionally fraught situation. It seems to me at this point that we are being presented with Claire the villain and Frank the martyr. And that's just not the story we're given in the text. I'm all for freedom of interpretation, but I'm not a fan of actively changing the story. Every mom who's read Voyager knows what scene I'm talking about when I mentioned the dinner party uh, Claire is preparing for. It's such a relatable, epically bad day for Claire, and she reacts in such a human way. When they cut to Claire and Brie, I thought, yes, we're finally getting to see this on screen. Instead, we got a precious scene with Brie rolling over for the first time. And while that's great, it sets up more wounded Frank. Is Frank wounded? Yes. Did Claire wound him? Yes. Does he respond with grace in the book? No. At this point, we're getting a completely different Frank and a decidedly colder Claire because she's responding to show Frank like book Claire, and that onus is on the writers. At this point in the season, we're going to keep seeing time jumps in every episode since we've got 20 years to cover by mid-season at the latest. Are we going to get the wine bottle scene in the next episode? I highly doubt it. And next to the print shop, it's the most well-written and easily the most relatable scene in the book. Claire's dream sequence of Jamie does a decent job of choreographing her turmoil. However, during the love scene on the living room floor, when Frank asks Claire to open her eyes and look at him, she responds appallingly and defensively, saying, well, if you're not in the mood, just say so. Mm. What? You know what? <laughs> This would make sense if this were Frank's story and he were extolling his woes, but it's not. It's Claire's story, and this is not the Claire we are presented with in Voyager. She still has her moments in the book, sure, but it really is hard to root for show Claire. I'm going to give two different kilt ratings for this episode, one for Jamie's storyline and one for Claire's. For Jamie's, I'm giving it a solid 4.5. Uh, the scene between Jamie and Mary managed to be heartbreaking and beautiful, but not sexual, which is a nearly impossible line to balance. Mm -hmm. Claire's storyline, I'm giving three kilts. The performances are on point, but the story is being skewed. And I'm not fond of the creative team's choices here. Overall, I think it balance out, balances out to about a four. I'm excited to meet Lord John Gray next week and also to see more from Joe Abernathy, who's such a great character going forward. Sorry if it was a long one. That's all for this week. Sayonara from Japan. Thank you, Yay, Kendra. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you. I, I will say one thing, Kendra. I I think you're right on on all of it, except for the fact when you start comparing Voyager the book to to season three the show. Right. This is Claire's story, and it is. We have to be true to Claire. But the show and the machinations of the show, the, the mythology of the show, has told you that Frank is a good man. Frank is someone who is someone we could root for if we really chose to. And Claire is someone that is kind of mess not I don't want to say messing up, but Claire is someone who isn't as likable as we probably want her to be right now in terms of the the overall the overall viewing experience and why am i saying this yes I, you're right that they're they're taking a fundamental characteristic of frank in the book and changing it but they have already made frank their, his own character within this television show so yes it's not frank in the book and Claire may be reacting to Frank the way that she did in the book, and perhaps she's justified in the book for acting the way that she did in the book. But in the show, Frank is a different character, and we, we kind of have to accept that. Mm -hmm. So my, 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 my problem with what you're saying, Kendra, is this. 
does it make sense, his actions, do they make sense to show Frank? Is it one thing for show Frank to be this way? Do they make sense? Is it logical? Yeah. Okay. I and think it, show Frank has been show Frank and has been consistent. And I'm not Kendra, but you right. trust Kendra, but I'm answering. I think show Frank has been consistent. I think as long as the characters are consistent within the story that we are watching, then we're okay. Like I said in the last episode, if 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 Frank was book Frank in the beginning and all of a sudden he turned into show Frank this this past season, I'd be like, whoa, okay, bro. No, that don't that don't work for me. It just it just doesn't work. Because it wouldn't make sense to that one character. But since Frank has remained consistent throughout this whole season, it feels like it makes sense to me. But that that is just me, Kendra. Don't kill me. It's just please. making Claire look bad. It does make Claire look a little bad. I, you know what? Looking bad is probably not even the right word. It just doesn't make her as likable as we probably want her to be. And we're just not getting Claire. Enough Claire. And how could you get Claire? Because no. that's what I'm saying. Because she's so effed up right now between uh, traveling through time, being pregnant, giving birth. I just feel like we're seeing things from Frank's perspective more than we're seeing things from Claire's perspective. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made there, but I think there's also an argument that we're still seeing it from Claire's perspective. Like we're seeing things in the tally mark of things that Claire does wrong that Frank would remember when he's keeping score. As opposed score, to as what of, he's doing wrong. Correct, or just as opposed to anything Claire's doing right. Yes. A for effort, I Claire. will give you that. I will give you that, that it seems like Frank is always doing the right thing. Yes. Whereas Claire, it seems it's to be like the one. It's like this is Frank's diary. Like, I really had a nice dinner party and I complimented my wife and we joked. And then she, we started to have sex, but she wouldn't look at me. And I kindly asked her to look at me and she wouldn't. And I just, I know she's, like, I just feel like I'm reading Frank's diary. And this is where Kendra is partially right because... She's saying, well, this is Claire's story, so we should see more of Claire as opposed to what Frank would potentially see in Claire as well. But you know, you and I both know, that when you're pregnant, your hormones are just... Watch, uh, watch yourself. You know what I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm just saying your hormones are, are all over the place. Okay, point taken. And, and, and <laughs> things happen, and you don't necessarily know why they happen. It's It's... I'm going to get in trouble here, so I, I don't want to continue. I don't want to continue. But I'm just saying I, I can see why things aren't going right for Claire, even though she may want them to go right. It's kind of like this whole thing of like when she's saying, I miss my husband. There's that 99% of her is like, it's Jamie. Mm -hmm. But that 1% of her is like, I'm really trying here. I really want yes, this to be Frank. Yes. And that's what I'm saying here. Like, okay. You know what I'm getting? I'm getting I get at? It. Okay. Are you ready, my darling, for the outlandish theory of the week? You bet I am. Let's do it. Actually, this outlandish theory of the week is brought 